This morning our speaker is uh, one of our church planters, and for those of you who are junior church kids who are in with us, uh, a church planter is not a, a decoration like this thing in front of me that you put around the church that might have a, something green or a plant in it. Uh, a church planter is someone that we as a church have sent out uh, to a different part of the country, a different part of the world uh, to start a new church. And I'm so thankful for Stephen and Tammy West. Uh, Stephen, I believe, grew up here in, in Greenville, and this was his home in the southeast. I think Tammy was from Indianapolis, uh, from where I grew up, a, a sister church and school that uh, I remember playing sports against when I was a kid. And they were willing to say, this is God's call, and with Morningside sending us, we're going to go all the way out to Las Vegas, Nevada, out to the desert and plant a church, Canyon Springs Baptist Church, back in 2009. It's been almost 10 years ago uh, that they felt God's call and we as a church were able to send them to plant a church. Uh, they have three sons, Curtis, Camden, and Clayton, and uh, they have been serving the Lord there for most of the, for the boys, I think, most of their lives. And uh, it's exciting to see what God has done. It's a very difficult area. I remember the first time I went to Las Vegas, all I pictured was the, the strip and the casinos, but realizing it's a really a military town. There are a lot of other people living in that area, and whenever you have a military town, you have a lot of transient church members, which is very difficult to pour your life into evangelizing and discipling. I remember a couple of years ago, Stephen shared a presentation where he just showed slide after slide of families that they had led to Christ and been discipling and then they got new military assignment and had to, to leave the area. But it's wonderful to have the Wesses with us this morning. Uh, if you are interested in going out west and uh, interested in helping with a church plant, please talk to Stephen or Tammy afterwards. I know they would love to have more core group members coming out and joining their team. But I'm going to ask Stephen to come now and open God's word to us. Good morning. It is good to be here this morning. This is home. Um, as we were uh, singing songs, I, 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 love, I love singing, but I have to be honest with you this morning and just say I couldn't sing most of the time. And the only reason I couldn't sing most of the time was because I was choked up with emotion. Uh, being here for 15 years of my life, just missing that music. What a blessing uh, to be able to have the orchestra and the choir and the congregation singing and just harmonizing together and pouring out their hearts and wow, it just brought back a flood of memories. And I was trying my best to sing and I just couldn't. Uh, but it is always a delight to be back home. Pastor already introduced my family, but I'm gonna I'm going to put them on the spot. They're going to hate me for this later, but I'm just going to have them stand and actually just walk right over here so everybody, so I know some of the balcony probably can't see it well if I just have them stand there, so I'm going to force them to stand up. I, I, I tell my boys all the time that one of my greatest assignments is to get all the pride out of them. <laughs> and this is one small way that I think I can help along the way. At least I'm not going to make you sing this morning, okay? You got off the hook that way, so... Kurt, Curtis is my oldest on the far end there, and he's 13, so we have a teenager now. And uh, Camden is almost uh, 11. I'm sorry, almost 12. Yes, Camden, I'm sorry. <laughs> he was quick to us. You saw that. He was uh, not, not going to let me get away with that. And Clayton, our youngest, is almost 10. And uh, Clayton, when we first moved out there, we were carrying him like this. And so a lot has changed uh, over those few years. And my wife, Tammy, and she's an asset to the ministry. Just to say one quick word uh, about her, but the area of Las Vegas where we were at when we first moved there, uh, we, there was another church planner who had only been there for a, a few years, and I was asking another pastor about him, and he said, well, he was there but, but couldn't stay uh, faithful to the ministry because his wife was not in it with him. I can tell you, I, I would not have been in it this long if it wasn't for my wife, and so I really appreciate her faithfulness and her servant's heart, her humility, and uh, this is a blessing to have my family here with me this morning. I'll let them go back now, and I've embarrassed them enough. Um, I do need to take care of one just 
small business matter right away and just want to make something very clear. Uh, I've been a part of Morningside for 24 years in total. 1994 was when I became a part of this ministry. Uh, served right from the very beginning, got involved in junior church, bus ministry, uh, worked with the teenagers, became a junior high director for several years, college and career director for several years. Uh, you name it, I played softball, basketball, I've got blood all over this building somewhere from my years of, of working here at the church. And so I am a morning cider, I bleed morning side blood. Now the reason why I'm saying that this morning is because there's a family that's just recently became members here at Morningside and they happen to share the same last name with me. And so you may, may have met them, I don't know if you have or not, but I just want to make sure because of my 24 years of seniority, this has already happened a few times, I'm not David's brother, okay? Uh, at this point, he should still be referred to as Stephen's uh, brother, but I want to make that clear because in our four weeks of traveling so far, I've been in a church where everybody knew David, and so I was David's brother there. I was in a church, everybody knew my sister, so this is Julie's brother. But here at Morningside, that's not going to be the case. I still have seniority, so he's a year older than me. It may not look like it, but, uh, even, but I have seniority here at Morningside. So just to help, bear with me, and, and I like to just be able to keep my name for as long as I possibly can here in this ministry. Now, I'm going to do, and so you can probably see it, okay. I'm going to do something a little different here to start off our time this morning, and I'm not, not really accustomed, per se, per se, to doing a lot of topical messages. Right now, in our church in Las Vegas, we're going through the book of Galatians, uh, verse by verse, phrase by phrase, and so it's a little bit different for me, and, and it's even going to be a little stranger in, in one regard as well, as you see uh, this this morning. But you, you see on the screen behind me a list, or a question here. What do these names have in common? So I'm going to read a list of names for you, okay? And just bear with me, and, and, and I'm going to ask you afterwards. You can, you can speak out loud if you'd like to and see if you can answer that question. But just, uh, just bear with me as I, I read it. I'm going to do my best not to slaughter these, okay? Uh, if, if you don't think that my pronunciation is good, just uh, forgive me, okay? All right, here we go. We have Lydia, Sopater, Secundus. Barsabas, Philip, Agabus, Manasin, Ananias, Phoebe, Priscilla, Aquila, Apinatus, Mary, Andronicus, Junia, Amplius, Urbane, Stachys, Apollos, Aristobulus, Herodion, Narcissus, Tryphena, Tryphosa, Persis, Rufus, Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermas, Petrobus, Hermes, Belologus, Julia, Nereus, Olympus, Timothy, Lucius, Jason, Sosipater, Tertius, Gaius, Erastus, Quartus, Sosthenes, Stephanus, Fortunatus, Achaicus, Titus, Barnabas, Tychicus, Epaphroditus, Clement, Onesimus, Aristarchus, Marcus, Epaphras, Luke, Archippus, Silas. How are we doing? We got a few more. Carpus, Onesiphorus, Otrophimus, Eubulus, Pudens, Linus, Claudia, Artemis, Zenus, Aphia, Philemon. Are they coming online? Nope. There we go. All right, so you can just say out loud if you'd like, that'd be fine. What do these names have in common? Church planners? Pa okay. All right. Very, you guys are just too good, all right? And, and, and if I was to answer the question simply, and I think I heard it over here, the answer would be Paul. Now, you could say names in the Bible, that would be right. Believers, yes. Church planters, I like that as well, absolutely. Uh, but really, the, the common denominator between all these people is one word, Paul. Uh, when, when you think of Paul, the Apostle Paul, as probably like myself growing up as a young person, I put him on a very high pedestal. And rightfully so. He was a man God used greatly. Absolutely, no question about it. 
But when you really do study out the New Testament, you find out by Paul's own letters and the history of the book of Acts that Paul had a team around him doing the work. I used to just look at Paul as kind of like the John Wayne of the New Testament. You know, this maverick, strong, uh, pioneer, go-getter, tough, nothing's going to stop him. But when you read these names and the things associated with them, you realize that the Apostle Paul was just human like you and me. And he needed support. Try to categorize these in many different ways. And the first category I just described are the mentors, or I like just to call these affectionately the gray hairs, or the white hairs, or the no hairs, if that fits, okay? Uh, these, these individuals are crucial to any kind of ministry. Uh, in the Apostle Paul's life, right off the bat, he had a man by the name of Ananias, God called to help him early on in his life. A man by the name of Manasseh, a guy by the name of Agabus, a prophet, was helpful in Paul's ministry. But if you're thinking of one person that stands out as a mentor in Paul's life, who would you say that would be? Very good. A man by the name of Barnabas. In Acts chapter 11, you're welcome to turn to these passages as well. I have them on the screen behind me. Acts chapter 11, verse 22. Here we see Barnabas being called to go up to Antioch because some great things were happening there. And the church in Jerusalem needed a strong a man led of the Spirit to go up there and, and, and lead these people. And Paul took on, I mean, Barnabas took that responsibility in verse 24 tells us he was a good man, full of the Spirit, and of faith, and what happened as a result of his ministry. Much people was added unto the Lord. Now, just stop there for a moment and understand this. Barnabas was early on very successful, a godly man, doing the work in Antioch, the new hub for the New Testament church. And, and rightfully so, he could have probably continued like that for years to come. But the very next verse tells us this, what? He departed, Barnabas did, to Tarsus to do what? Saul, Saul would, he had now been a believer for many, many years. He's growing in his walk with the Lord. But Barnabas knew this man had great potential. And I've got to bring him down here. I've got to take him under my wing. I've got to teach him how to be a church planner. I've got to teach him what it means to do ministry. And so he brought, them, brought him there to Antioch, and, and we, we see from there now a transition taking place as the one being mentored becomes the church planter across that part of the world. We need mentors. Paul himself knew this so well that in his epistles he went on to, to teach that the responsibility of the older men and the older women in the church is to do what? It's a great responsibility for those who are older, wiser in ministry, who have years of experience under their belt. It's their responsibility to teach the next generation. And this next generation needs that generation greatly. You probably have observed it, maybe from a distance you're saying, what's going on with these young people? Well, it's one thing to be upset with what's going on, but there's a part for you to play in that. There's a part for you to influence that next generation. Okay? Beyond just teaching behind a pulpit to come alongside of them as Barnabas did, to show them what it's like to really follow Christ. There's a very important role for mentors in any church work. Now, this is not an English word. I, it's just one I made up, but I'm calling this the hospitables. Okay? Now, we see several different people fit into this category. In Acts chapter 12, a lady by the name of Mary, the mother of John Mark, she has a home, and Peter comes out of prison, is knocking on the door, and what are they doing in her home? They're having a prayer meeting, right? She opened up her home to be used for the church. Lydia, she used her home for Paul when he was traveling, a place to stay. Aquila and Priscilla many times were blessing the Apostle Paul's ministry and using their possessions, their home for the work of the Lord. Aphia and Archippus and Philemon too are using their home for the Lord. Our possessions don't belong to us. We, we, it's so easy for us to hold so tightly onto these earthly things. We need to view them as a stewardship that God has entrusted us with for His purposes, not our own. And these are people that said, these are not 
These are not ours. Mi casa, su casa. It's, it's, it's my house. It's not really my house. It's your house. Do you need it? How do you need it? It's yours for the Lord. We see a lot of those folks in Paul's ministry. And then the most general category, Paul uses this word over and over and over again with so many different people called laborers. I'm just going to mention a few of them. Like Phoebe, Romans chapter 16, verse 1 and 2. She's called a deaconess. Now, she doesn't hold the office of a deacon, but she is serving in a ministerial capacity to the women and the children of the church. And it says there in, in, in our English that she has been a succorer, the idea of a, a defender or a protector. This is a woman that's making sure everything's going well at church. She's not a busybody. She's not a gossip. She's just making sure people are doing their part, and she's helping in that, and she's serving tirelessly. She's a hardworking woman. Romans 16, we find out that here's a man by the name of Tertius. He's the one who actually penned the epistle Romans. Right there along with the Apostle Paul, helping him do the thing he couldn't do very well at that moment. A man by the name of Epaphroditus is a companion in labor. And he, he exhausted himself so much, it was almost to the point of death he served. Whatever Paul needed him to do, he could simply say, Epaphroditus, I, I have a task for you. Epaphroditus was right there at attention, whatever Paul needed him to do. Isn't it wonderful to have that kind of blessing, to have those kind of leaders, the people that have that kind of heart that says, here am I, Lord, send me. What do you need me to do? I'll do it. And there are some examples of, of people that Paul was surrounded by. Now, of course, we are very familiar with different people that Paul had as partners in ministry. I already named one of them. In Acts chapter 13, verse 2, uh, Barnabas uh, started with Paul right off the very beginning, the two of them. They had, they, he was a partner. You had Silas, who was a partner of Paul's in Acts chapter 15. Timothy, in Ephesus, he's there with, with the apostle Paul ministering and serving, and Paul eventually leaves him there, okay? They had partners. This final category, I think, is one that we can't take lightly here, and it's so important, and Paul mentions a lot of people, and I just put them all into this category, encouragers. Sopater, Secundus, Trophimus, in Acts chapter 20, verse 4, Paul just says, they accompanied me. They were companions. It doesn't say what per se, they, they weren't necessarily music ministry. We don't know if they served as deacons. It doesn't tell us anything about them except they were just with Paul. They were just with him. They were companions. You know, God understands this about us. At the very beginning, the first book of our Bible, we read early on that God understands the basic framework of the human being so much so that he provided for Adam what? A companion, a wife. Why? Because it's a blessing to share life with somebody else. The ups, the downs, all of it, to have someone experiencing it with you. In the case of these individuals, they were just simply people there that were ears for the Apostle Paul. The good days when he just wanted to give praises, they were there to hear it. The days whenever they just, he just wanted to pour out his heart about discouragements, they were there. Just companions. Certainly Paul, while he was in prison, excuse me, I gotta go back to it. Oh. We had uh, fellow prisoners, Andronicus, Junia, Aristarchus, Epaphras, certainly Silas as well. Just fellow prisoners. That's not an easy time of life. And certainly prisons back then were not like our prisons today. Much more harsher environments. Just to have some folks there to sing and pray with and just have a, just have a fellowship. What a blessing for Paul. Now these po folks, again, we know very little. We know nothing about them. Only one time are their names mentioned in Romans 16. Epinetus, Amplius, Stachys. And all Paul says about them is they're beloved. What do they do? I don't know, but I simply put this in the category. Paul loved these guys. I call these friends, good friends. I call these buddies. Isn't it nice to have friends in the ministry, doing service for the Lord, just to have like-minded brothers and sisters in Christ just, to, just to, to talk to and share what's going on? And Paul had guys like that, people he loved, he cherished. They were buddies, encouragers. Again, here's three guys. <clears throat> You're welcome to look at it with me if you'd like. But in this particular passage in 1 Corinthians 16, Paul says something about them. 
that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. <clears throat> For they have what? Say it out loud. <clears throat> they have refreshed my spirit. Do you think Paul ever got discouraged? Do you think he was worn out? Do you ever think he thought, you know what, I've done my part? Let the younger guys take over from here? I mean, I'm sure he just exhausted himself, and he just needs times of refreshment. And here were some guys that God placed in his life along the way for him just to be refreshed in his spirit, encouraged. He says the same thing about the uh, Onesiphorus. He has often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. We started this trip about four, well, it was about five weeks ago. We're on kind of like a mini furlough. We're traveling around and just ministering in different churches. We are sharing our burden for Las Vegas. I was talking with a pastor on the phone before we started our trip. He was in Detroit, Michigan. And after we finished our phone call, I said, well, when my family comes into town and we're there along the way, it's kind of nice to be able to see something historic. Uh, something that's unique to the area. I said, what's unique about Detroit, Michigan? Well, what can we see? And he said, well, uh, what about uh, the Henry Ford Museum, uh, Greenfield Village? Now, I know who Henry Ford is, but I'd never been to that museum or to that village. And so I was like, well, that, that sounds nice. He said, I, I can get you some passes to go there. Oh, okay, great. So we showed up there, my family, and as we drove up and walked over to the place, I realized it was a lot bigger than I expected. I was expecting a small building with a few antique cars in it. You know, we were going to be there for maybe 30 minutes and take a couple pictures, and I, I, could, I was clueless as to the extent uh, of this place. And uh, so I knew I thanked him, but I felt like I really needed to thank him significantly more once I saw what I was getting myself into. And we looked at the ticket booth, and I had totaled it up, but it would have been well over $300 for our family to have paid those ticket prices. So he was doing us a very nice thing by letting us go there. Well, he said, you, want, you might want to spend most of your time at the Greenfield Village. It's very unique. There's a lot of Americana, a lot of buildings that were transplanted there, like the Wright Brothers, their old bicycle shop. They actually transplanted it to Greenfield Village. Menlo Park. Thomas Edison, where he had all of his buildings, his laboratory, they transplanted it to Greenfield Village. So as we were walking around and I, we come, came up to Menlo Park, I saw a plaque, and it was about Thomas Edison, and this is what it said. Thomas Edison believed the best creations came from people working together. His team of workers brought both traditional craft skills and new scientific knowledge to the exciting challenges facing them at this laboratory. We're talking about people that were just simple blue-collar workers, maybe custodial, cleaning the floors. Some of them had engineering degrees. Everybody had a different giftedness about them. But when I, if I was to ask you this morning who invented the light bulb, you would say, you'd say Thomas Edison. But Thomas Edison, if he were standing here today, would say, well, yes, my name's on the patent. That's what people think of them when they think of me. But the reality is there was a lot of other people doing work behind the scenes that should get some credit for it. See, the, they not understand this in the secular world. Henry Ford himself understood the value of this. People working in a factory environment to produce some sort of product. Is it any different in ministry? Well, I don't think it is. And for, for, our, for our purposes, being in Las Vegas for this uh, many nine years now, I, we've come to the same conclusion. The reality is that the church is most successful when all of God's people are working together. God has blessed us with some great people along the way, and we've seen God use those people to help grow the work. But I want to say this morning, as a morning cider, two morning ciders, commissioned by morning side, sent by morning side, that Canyon Springs Baptist Church is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's his ministry. But as a morning side sent for morning side, it's just as much your ministry 
as it is my wife and I's. And I know it's so easy to forget that as we look at the missionaries and the prayer cards and, and, and we pray for them and we financially support them. The reality is, folks, that you, we are just an extension of you. Would you like to see the work in Las Vegas continue? Is it worth keeping alive? Now we've, we've gone through some trials, good, good times and bad, struggles along the way. Every ministry faces them. It's not just us. But I think it's worthy to keep going. Well, I think it's worthy to keep going. There's, there's still so many people there, and they keep on coming. This is what people think of when they think of Las Vegas, as was uh, Pastor mentioning earlier. But really, Las Vegas is much bigger than this. Okay, this is a Google map picture of Las Vegas. And what I just showed you a picture of a moment ago is really that's that little spot right there. Can you see the outline of the city, the fairly greenish area compared to the desert on the outside? The, what I showed you a moment ago, this is just, whoops, sorry, let me get back to it. Right there, that strip. There we go. Our side of town is over here on the west side, a place called Summerlin, about 15 minutes away from what most people think of when they think of the Strip. Now just look how the last 34 years have changed in population in Las Vegas. This is a Google map of Las Vegas in 1982. So I want to go through this. Now that's just two years ago. I have to say that one of the reasons why the Lord uh, really burdened our heart and called us there was because back around 2006, Pastor Miller was seeing this. He was seeing the growth in Las Vegas and I said to him, we had breakfast together and I said, Pastor, I said, we're going to fly into Las Vegas and drive up Interstate 15 looking into Utah, uh, places that need a gospel preaching church and he said, no, I believe it's the Lord's leading. He said, why don't you look at Las Vegas? It's growing. It needs a good gospel work there. And at the, at the time, honestly, my, my mind was, I'll do it because Pastor Miller said we ought to look at it. But I never thought we would go there. I never did. I thought it would be, oh, we would just do our duty because it would pastor. But the Lord, over the next few years, began to really change our perspective. Because so to the point where, right now, if I was to say, could you imagine yourself living in Las Vegas? You would pro you're probably thinking right now the way we thought back in 2006 before the Lord began to change our hearts and burden us for that city. Here's just another way of looking at the city here, that same 1982 picture. And here's the area where we're living in, Summerlin. How many of you know the name Howard Hughes? Okay. Howard Hughes bought 25,000 acres of desert land and before he died, he did nothing with it. His corporation, the Howard Hughes Corporation, changed names to the Summerlin Corporation. So that area where we live and the area where we minister is that 25,000 acres of land that Howard Hughes bought many, many years ago. Now you can see it's totally desert, 1982. To just show you again how, the, the, how things are just moving out that direction. So that in 34 years where we live, everything is newer than 34 years. Effectively, this red area is about the re reach of our church because we have folks, you can see a little, I don't know if you can tell, that's a cross right there. That's where we currently meet. We meet at a library for our services. But we have folks, there's us, a few people around the church, different places. These are folks that are part of our church. So effectively, our reach is somewhere in that region. It's approximately 25 minutes any which way. And that's about 1 million people. There's a lot of work, a lot of people that need the Lord. And so for that very reason alone, I think it's worthy to stay alive and to keep on working and serving there. But as Pastor said a little bit ago, it is a transient area. We started with 19 charter members in 2011. And out of those 19 charter members, we still have four remaining. Two of those four are my wife and I. One of them is her father. 
The other name, uh, lady has a name by the name of Shirley. I think I might even have a picture of her in a little bit. But here's some folks the Lord just led to us early on and, and have moved away. This is just folks that we've had a chance to serve. We, we were able to knock on doors, be invited into the living room of the, this couple, the Rays, Raul and Gwenda. And we were able to lead Gwenda to the Lord and she became a charter member of the church. And then a year later, they moved to Korea. Kim and Jerry started discipling them on a weekly basis. After a few months of that, we were able to lead Kim to the Lord. They've moved on since then. Betty, 2011, led her to the Lord in her living room, was with us for five, six years, but her health has deteriorated, so she's not able to be with us anymore. Terry, led into the Lord in 2015, has moved back to California. Joe and Casey, he grew up in San Diego, and they lived in Hawaii for a while, and he was a part of a gang in a prison. Lord saved him out of that, and we started discipling him and his family, his wife Casey, this is two years ago, and we led her to the Lord, baptized both of them, but they have moved on since being with us. Jennifer and Sean, Jennifer grew up as a Catholic, came to know Christ as Savior uh, through some unusual circumstances, able to baptize her, lead her, help her to grow. She became one of our faithful teachers of our children's programs. Now that they live in New Mexico now. Michael and Crystal. Michael grew up a Mormon. He is actually a racist for most of his life, and we found out in, this, in his testimony later on about this. Uh, she grew up in a charismatic church. They came. We were able to grow, help them grow. We baptized Michael, and a few years later, he became a deacon in our church. They moved to Alaska. And of course, the Kendalls. How many of you know the Kendalls? Okay. Tom and Melissa. What a blessing to have had them for several years. Now they're serving on the mission field. We are their sending church. What a blessing to have them. They're going to come back in November. We're looking forward to seeing them. This is why we believe it's worthy what God has allowed us to do. And also for the people that remain, there's surely one of our charter members who's been with us from day one. She's a blessing to the church. She's kind of like that Phoebe, just a servant. She's a mother hand, a protector of many in the church. We're so thankful for her. Glenn and Sharon, what a blessing to have them. And Glenn came to Las Vegas to play his electric guitar in the music industry. We spent the first couple years just meeting in our living room, discipling them. Uh, later on, they both were baptized and uh, just continued to grow. And it was such a blessing three or four months ago when Glenn came up to me and said, Pastor, just recently I decided I can't go downtown and play anymore in those nightclubs. He said, it's just not a good place to be. I don't think God wants me to be there. I never actually had to say to him, don't do that because we just systematically taught him and allowed the Holy Spirit to convict and teach him these things that he ought to know. And uh, see him go from a devout Catholic and a Buddhist in his life and to see him just loving the Lord. And now his favorite thing to do is to call up all of his buddies from the past, to all those guys he played in uh, the, uh, the bands with, and he just shares the gospel with them. And we're just so grateful for a couple like this that have been a part of our church for such so, so a long time. Jim and Missy in the background there, uh, Jim up on the right side and Missy in the middle, they weren't going to any church and started coming and I started meeting with them on a weekly basis and discipling them and eventually baptized them. And just in March, Jim became one of our deacons. They're the reason why I think we need to stay there, keep on growing, helping them grow in their walk with the Lord. Jason was in prison, the guy in the middle with the blue shirt and the tie. DUI felony, felonies. He just got out a couple years ago, got his license back just a few months ago. He, need, he loves the Lord and is uh, faithfully serving, and what a blessing to have him. He's a great reason for us to stay there and help him grow in his walk with the Lord. We have Barbara on the left there. Barbara's been coming for four or five years. When she first started coming as an atheist, she only came for social reasons because she had some other family coming to our church. Wasn't interested in the Word. In fact, was making fun of us most of the time as she was attending. God has softened her heart after four or five years that about three months ago, I said to Barbara, why don't we start meeting weekly and having a Bible study? And to my surprise, she said, okay. At the same time, we had made a transition to another home and across the street, we met Rob and a neighbor of ours and she started coming and I said, why don't you and Barbara come weekly? So my wife and I meet with Barbara and Robin on a weekly basis. We're looking forward to resuming that when we get back. The last thing both of them said to me is, pastor, don't give up on us. We're really close. We're understanding, but we're really close to, 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 to understanding the gospel. So don't give up on us. Marita on the right, it just came in the last six to nine months. Her husband is in his 90s, grew up in Germany. He was only a year too young to serve in the Nazi army in World War II. He's an atheist. She comes to church. She's Hungarian. She's a blessing. And she's in her 60 plus years, but... She's only very young in her walk with the Lord. 
Susan on the left has a husband and she takes care of, has health problems. We don't believe he's a believer. She started coming and she's also young in her understanding of her walk with the Lord. Great reasons to keep on working and serving and pastoring and shepherding these folks. We have Vic, Vic and uh, Victor, uh, Maria and Victoria just started coming. They moved from New York City recently. Filipino family, and we're just loving to getting to know them. Right before I left to go on this trip, he said, Pastor, when you get back, we need to start a regular time to, to meet with you so we can grow in our walk with the Lord. Are these people worthy of being shepherded? Absolutely. They're the reason why we're there. But I can just tell you over nine years of being there and having the blessing of young people serving alongside of us and now having a lot of those folks taken away, folks, what we're looking for right now are some partners in ministry. Some po folks that are going to come alongside of us and serve with us and encourage us while doing some of the work themselves and to help us move this thing forward. Because we've seen our ups and downs numbers wise, but we believe it's a worthy work. And it's your work. It's yours. What would God have you to do above what you're already doing? And we so much thank you for your prayers. We so much thank you for, for your financial support. We thank you when you send mission teams to be out with us. But who will receive the call of God and respond to it about actually coming out and being partners on site with us? This is your church plant. This is not the Wes's church plant. It's a church plant out of Morningside Baptist Church. And we're asking God to burn some others to join us in seeing this work continue. And Pastor read this verse, and I didn't start with it, but Philippians 4, verse 3, I love this verse. It's the only time this English word is used. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, Paul is addressing the entire church at Philippi, all of them. And he identifies the entire church with a growing, strong, healthy church that Paul rejoices in. And he says about all of them, you are yoke fellow. Now what does that mean? What is a yoke? Yeah, it's certainly used in farming as a way to keep animals together. We don't see it used as much today, if it at all, maybe in some places, but it's a device that, that would help these oxen to stay together. They'd share the load so that it was uh, being done evenly to work together so one's not pulling too much and getting worn out. The other one's not doing his job. And Paul says, the entire church at Philippi, they're all partners with me. They're all sharing the load, every one of them. All those Philippians, they're all an integral part of my church planting ministry. Because Paul understood, like even the secular world, like people like Thomas Edison understand. He understood this. He, by himself, certainly by God's grace, it's all possible. But God designed us to work together. He designed the church to work together. And if Paul was standing here today, he would say, folks, if I'm going to go and plant a church, I need some others to come with me. He would walk up here, humble, gray hair, gracious, sweet man, loves the Lord. He'd stand from this podium and say, I've got a mission. I've got a desire. I would like to go to Las Vegas. How many of you will come with me? Now, I'm not the Apostle Paul. But like the Apostle Paul, I understand how God works and uses people to accomplish ministry. And Paul says about the, the church, you've labored with me, you're, you're, you're burden bearers, and I need you to help some women labor that labor in the gospel. And then he says, with my other fellow laborers. You know, I'll leave you with this in Matthew chapter 9, that famous missions verse that we're all very familiar with. Christ says to his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but what? The laborers are few. You know, we so often we read that verse, it's just a great missions verse, and we're thinking about people who are called into full-time Christian work, right? You're to be a preacher, or a pastor, you're in full-time Christian work. We use that terminology. 
but Christ is at that moment serving and ministering and he is doing so much and he says to his disciples, I just need other people doing the same kind of laboring work. So pray that the Lord will send other laborers to come and do this work. So would you pray with me that the Lord would send some of those other laborers and would you pray about the possibility that God might use you. If God has called you to Greenville, South Carolina, then Greenville, South Carolina is where you should be. But if you're in Greenville, South Carolina, because it's a great, comfortable place to be as a Christian, you will not grow as a Christian. You'll be stagnant, you'll enjoy all the blessings, but you won't be giving as you ought to be giving, and as a result, you won't go as far as you could go with the Lord. But if God's called you here, this is where you should be. But if that's not the case, go where God has called you to go and be open to wherever that might be, even a place that you disdain like Las Vegas, Nevada. Just like Corinth, Paul went to a difficult, difficult place. And a lot of great things happened there. Wow, what an opportunity to go to a place where there's lots of sinners who need the Lord and pray that the Lord would send laborers there and pray and ask the Lord to open up your heart to the possibility that that might be you. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for this church. We thank you for the ongoing ministry and the leadership here. I thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be called out of this place, commissioned, sent, Lord, I pray that right now you would begin a churning in the heart of someone. It could be a young family just starting out. It could be a college young person. It could be one of those gray hairs. Someone who's seen lots of ministry and now they can give back in a different capacity. But Lord, would you just work and lead and send forth laborers into the harvest? because the harvest is truly plenteous, and it is no time to give up. So Lord, I pray that your spirit would work among us and do the work of calling those laborers in Jesus' name, amen. As we saw all those names at the beginning in that first slide, I was thinking about uh, young couple who just earlier in the service shared with me they knew they were expecting they found out they were expecting twins and I thought that's a lot of name ideas uh, <laughs> but most of us in this room even those of us who have given our children biblical names haven't used any of those names uh, th those names are of, of people that we literally only have one or two words but their names as Philippians 4 says are written in the Lamb's book of life these are trophies of grace. And then later on when we saw all these faces and names of primarily young couples, most of whom from very unchurched, ungodly backgrounds, in prison and gangs that have been led to Christ. And, and I, I was thinking, can you imagine if a church our size were reaching our community the way Canyon Springs has over the last nine years? If, if over the last 19 years we had reached a percentage of as many people as they have. Uh, is the Lord calling you to be a laborer? We've had one family who retired, the DeJesus, just recently out to Las Vegas. Some of you who are retired, you don't have roots, you don't have a job holding you back, this would be a wonderful place to come and assist a, a young family, a young church family that has, has come from our church from Morningside, uh, maybe as, as the Lord is leading some of you college students who haven't yet put down roots or found a career, this would be a, a place to look for jobs and, and talk to the Wesses afterwards. Are there jobs in my career field? A, a city that large, two million people, uh, is, is going to have an economy that would support all kinds of professions. Uh, as, as a church, are we, even if the Lord has called you to stay in Greenville, are we reaching people, are we seeing names added to the Lamb's Book of Life, trophies of grace that God is calling out 
of our neighborhoods out of Greer and out of Taylor's and out of the east side of Greenville? Are, are we uh, doing this work of the ministry? Are we encouragers? Are we hospitables? Are we doing what we've, we see in the New Testament as Paul writes these letters to these churches and these people that he's planted? Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed for just, just a minute. And before the musicians begin to play, let me ask you, are you a laborer? Are you laboring in the field where God has placed you? Are, are you open to the field where God may put you, a field that is white to harvest? As the musicians play, if you would like to know more about how you can have a relationship with Christ, how you can be part of the family of God, how you can go from, as Pastor Jones said, all of us in this room probably have pagan, savage ancestors who God by His grace, has called out over the years, maybe for some of you just in your lifetime, you're a first-generation Christian. This morning, if you would like to know how you can come to Christ, we have counselors who would love to show you how that can happen. If you are a believer and you're not doing the work of the ministry, you're not sharing the gospel, you're not calling your your friends and family to the good news of Jesus Christ, uh, would you be open to doing that? Would you be open to going somewhere? and helping a church plant. As musicians play, let's let the Holy Spirit work in our hearts. Father, we thank you for Stephen and Tammy and their boys. We thank you for a church, for pastors like Pastor Miller who have a heart and a vision as Morningside has had all of these years for planting churches. We pray that you would help us to, to not only say be warmed and filled to the Wesses, but to be able to, to tangibly support them. I thank you for work teams and mission teams, for couples who've gone out even recently uh, to, to help I pray that if you would, even this morning, be calling folks to relocate to help with this church plant, that you would make that very clear in their minds, that you would give them opportunities to connect uh, with the Wests after the service. We pray that each of us, where you have put us, would be reaching out into our neighborhood, into our work community, into our friends, and, and sharing the gospel, calling people to Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. This time, it's my privilege to introduce Tony and Barb Every are coming for church membership. They have uh, turned from their sins and trusted Christ to be their savior. They've been baptized by immersion, gone through our starting point class, and affirmed our articles of faith. All in favor of accepting the Everys into our membership, would you signify by saying amen? Amen. amen. Any opposed by raise hand. I'm going to ask the Everys if they would join Carrie and, and my family, as well as the Wesses, if you would join us out in the fountain uh, tonight. Dr. Cruz is going to address the question in our Understanding Mission series, how can we make disciples in short-term missions? I hope you can come back at 5.30. Pastor Jones, would you dismiss us? What better reason to go to the reach of the world than out of our love for the Lord who himself has loved us first. Number nine in your hymnal, let's sing once through. The chorus, I love you, Lord. being with us. You are dismissed.